letting that one out there for me, boys. A little in and out. Uh, the teller is checking in for UFC Vegas 88. But as you guys could see, I'm not feeling too great under the weather here. Now, I caught a little something last Friday. And uh, it wasn't too bad. A little head cold, a little sore throat. In fact, I felt something going on right as I was filming that prop video that I did for UFC 299. And I felt pretty good on Sunday. Went to the beach, had myself a day. Uh, I wasn't drinking or nothing like that, taking it easy. But I actually feel worse now than I did uh, in the first couple of days of having this, which isn't really typical for me. Uh, but it's weird. It's like I had a feeling it was going to go like this. I had something like this this past winter. Or, you know, usually I get a cold and it's just, it's in and out a couple of days, but I was kind of worried it was going to be like one of the ones I had in December where it kind of went to my chest later on in the week after you feel like you're good, it goes to your chest and, uh, you know, I've been coughing up all types of stuff and, um, you know, my breathing's tight and, uh, you know, all that type of stuff, man. So, um, just bear with me, but the good news is that I've, I had plenty of time, uh, to cuddle up under the blankets and dive into the fight tape here and, uh, dissect these fights. Uh, I will make this, this video nice and crisp for you guys. I apologize for getting it out a little bit later than I like to. You guys know, I like to have these videos up and running by Sunday or Monday, and this will be up to you guys probably more like Tuesday night. So I apologize there, but you guys know I'm not missing a card. And I know this isn't the biggest of cards. We got a top 10, uh, heavyweight, um, Showdown here, uh, two top 10 ranked fighters in the heavyweight division. Uh, we, we all got love for Tui Vasa. I got much love for my boy Brian Battle. You guys know he's a, a, a fighter that always shows love on IG. Cool dude. I've chatted up with him before. Um, and you know what, though? I'm not going to hate on this card. There's some some bright prospects. Christian Rodriguez and Isaac Delgarian uh, facing off with each other. My boy Mike Davis, we interviewed him a long time ago. This guy never f steps in the cage, man. He's so inactive, but he's back taking on Natan Levy. Uh, there's some fun fights, man. Mitch Ramirez is another dude that you guys know I've, I've talked to quite a bit when he had that whole, uh, that whole episode go on where he was kicked off the Ultimate Fighter. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But there's some some young talent on this card. I'm excited for it. Uh, Danny Silva makes his UFC debut coming off a big time Dana White's contender series uh, performance and he's taking on Joshua Cooley bow. That's a good fight. All right, guys. So um, we'll jump into the first fight right here. We got the timestamps. If there's any fight you guys want to jump right to, uh, I hope you guys all cashed on that free play that I gave. Uh, that's We're now two for two. We have both of our two plays that we put on the channel as free plays. They were both underdog odds. We cashed in on Michael Venom Page. I hope you guys cashed there. I was a little disappointed. The views weren't as high as I would like. I guess I got to get them out even earlier in the week. Uh, but we're those will come out periodically, and we will cash. If you guys want to work with me for my official plays for this card or any card moving forward, don't hesitate to shoot me an email or a DM on Instagram and Twitter. And please, if you can, like this video, subscribe to the channel, and catch me on all my social media. It's, it's scrolling below. It means a lot to me, guys. All right, let's go jump into the first fight. Uh -huh. Welcome to the show. This is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The... MMA fortune, MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. The teller. Kicking the card off, we head over to the Bantamweight division where we got my boy, Charlampos Gregorio, taking on Chad N. Hellinger. Uh, both fighters come off Dana White's Contender Series um, uh, at different seasons, and these fighters are at different times in their career. There's no question about it. Chad's 37 years old. Uh, that is very much up there in age, especially considering he's in the bantamweight division here, coming off some very disappointing performances, just was submitted uh, in his last fight against Jose Johnson. On the other hand, Gregorio, you know, I'll be quite honest with you. I've been following his career for a long time. Uh, I, I've been really hoping that he was eventually going to make it to the UFC. Of course, you guys know I root on my fellow Greeks. And uh, so I, I've been very familiar with him. And Early on in his career, man, he had some performances where I, I really didn't know if he was even going to make the big show. I didn't know if he was going to make it to the big show. And even if he did, I was not really too confident that he would be able to hang around. I do not feel like that's the case at all right now. All right. He's been absolutely grinding over at Sarah Longo. Uh, if you talk to any of the fighters over there throughout the last couple of years, uh, they have nothing but rave reviews about his work ethic over there. And you see it delivering into his performances, right? You saw the the knockout victory that he had over uh, Smotherman, I believe his name was, who was a, a young prospect, a young, talented kid who, who trains out of Texas, who surrounds himself with some real talent. If you saw the way he set that combination up, uh, got the knockout there within one minute, that wasn't just a, a lucky shot, man. That was a beautiful combination that he set up there. Uh, so I, I think that he's really starting to hit his stride here. Uh, he had a loss to uh, Christian Rodriguez, who we'll be talking about later, a very talented fighter. Uh, lost to Josh Smith, which is a fighter that actually has, um, who Chad Enhillinger has a victory over. 
Um, so, you know, not, not that that means much. I mean, these fighters are at two different points in their career right now. And that's why I really feel that Gregorio is going to come out here and handle business has a massive reach advantage here. Uh, I mean, he has a huge, well, a 12 inch reach advantage. I mean, it's, it's, that's ridiculous. Uh, Chad is a fighter though. I just want to say this. He's a fighter that has delivered, uh, throughout his career when people have slept on him, he's a game fighter. Now uh, he's, he's a well-rounded fighter. He can mix in grappling if you're, you're suspect there, but I think Gregorio will be more than ready to uh, handle the grappling and on the feet. He's a little tricky and he switches stances and he's active, but uh, Gregorio is going to have a lot to offer him there. I think Gregorio is going to crack him uh, on the feet if they even play around there too much. So, I mean, all signs pointing to Gregorio. Now what's, what's interesting about this is Chad is a fighter that's never been knocked out before. So I'm kind of, Curious to see if Gregorio can test him there and maybe get a finish there. Uh, he's been looking dangerous on the feet and has that reach advantage and all that that we talked about. Uh, but then when you go down to the mat, uh, I thought this was pretty interesting as well. Um, as far as sim the submission goes, uh, Gregorio is a fighter that has zero subs on his resume where we have seen N. Hellinger submitted before, right? You take a look at his five, or excuse me, five of his seven listed results as far as his losses go. We have two unknown, which were early on in his career, but four of the five that are listed here have came by way of submission, right? He's been submitted. And we just talked about that sub loss. He just took uh, to Jose Johnson. He did not look good in that spot. Um, I don't, I don't know if Gregorio can maybe get him down to the mat and finish him there. I think it would be more likely that he clips him, hurts him, and then maybe sink some type of choke in. Um, but either way you want to spin it. I like Gregorio to get the job done here. I will be taking him to win the fight and I'll be excited to see him win that UFC debut. Uh, uh, spot that, that he's hitting here. So um, you take a look at the betting line right now. Now, depending what book you're looking at, on my bookie, he opened up as a minus 190, came down to a minus 210, and the line actually trends the other way, which I'm I'm liking because I want to be on the Gregorio side here, and I would just monitor that line and uh, try to get it right around minus one, 155. That'd be great. And some books still offer that. If you go, you take a look on, uh, on Bavada, he's a minus 155 right now on Bavada. Okay. So he opened as a minus 205 and the line has been coming down. So people feeling confident in Chad. I know why they feel confident in Chad. It has a lot to do with the fact that Gregorio hasn't been tested too much. Okay. And he had those early losses uh, besides the Smotherman victory, uh, a lot of lower level victories. You take a look at these guys. I mean, Efren Escudero, uh, Escarno, that is not Efren Escudero, uh, the former Ultimate Fighter winner, right? So uh, not to try to trick you there. You're not going to really recognize a lot of these guys' names. Chris Disanol, eh, maybe some of you guys know him. Joey uh, Christos, Christosmo Jr. Uh, you guys don't like the way I pronounce some of the UFC fighters' names. You guys want to hear me pronounce some of these uh, lower-level uh, regional fighters' names? How about that? I'll give you guys some pronunciations. How about this guy here? You want to hear me pronounce Turple? Kamziov, oh, that's actually pretty smooth there. I ain't gonna lie. All right, so that's the reason why you're seeing that movement. And Chad is an experienced fighter that has been in there with some legitimate talent, and he's shown up at times. So people feel there's value on him. But I caution you with his age, uh, the size disadvantage, and Gregorio is peaking as a fighter, 31 years old, and he's getting extensive work in with Ray Longo, uh, Chris Weidman, all those guys over there. He's training with all those killers over there. I'm telling you guys that. So watch him show up. And now. Don't forget, we are going to do a prop video. That prop video will be out later in the week. So we'll dive into some prop bets for, for this fight here. But as far as the money line goes, I think I was clear here. I like to be on the Gregorio side, and you should be able to get that 160 and down at least. Two young prospects facing off here in the women's strawweight division. Jacqueline Amarim taking on Corey McKenna. Now, Jacqueline, if you guys aren't familiar with her, she was the former LFA champion, came into the UFC. Uh, made her debut against Sam Hughes. She was a big time favorite and had a major letdown with her performance there. She did not get the job done. She did bounce back with the victory though over Montserrat Ruiz, uh, the tough Mexican chick who has that that wrestling uh, in her back pocket, but a fighter that really is not that good and she's been finished quite often, a very undersized fighter. Uh, but props to Jacqueline for getting her first UFC victory there. She got the finish in the third round. Uh, but let's be clear. Uh, Jacqueline is a Brazilian jiu-jitsu specialist. She's working on her striking She'll have a nice reach advantage here too. Um, but but all in all, I would say Corey McKenna is the better mixed martial artist. Uh, Amarim is a fighter that's relied very much so on her grappling. Five of her seven victories have come by way of submission. And uh, Corey McKenna is a fighter. You take a look at her two losses. Uh, she's only had 10 pro fights, but she's a young chick. But out of her two losses... Uh, both of them come by way of decision. She has never been submitted. She has never been finished as a pro. 
even when you think back to the Dana White's contender series performance that she had where she took an L, in all reality, you have to analyze that fight as a W for her. Uh, she survived down in the mat for an extensive amount of time against a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt and former LFA champion in Vanessa Demopoulos. Okay. She was just 20 years old at the time. What was McKenna? McKenna was 20 years old when she made that Dana White's Contender Series debut. This was four years ago. Okay. She's a career mixed martial artist. If you ever heard the stories about her, you see her there when she's young holding the trophies. Uh, you know, this was a girl that traveled the world. Really? She, her, her family uh, was, was big into the sport of MMA, MMA. And uh, I remember hearing stories about her, like begging her parents and, uh, or they were even supportive and they were uh, sending her away to train at these MMA camps. We know that she traveled the world to come all the way to California, traveling across America, uh, to go train over with team alpha male. I mean, this is a girl that has put the sport, uh, above all. Okay. And I think that with time, you're going to really see, uh, the, the fruits of her labor come out. I think so. I think she's, a, I think she's a promising fighter, uh, coming off a couple of victories here, uh, had a victory over Cheyenne Vlismus who should be coming back to the UFC in some time. Vlismus just had a baby, but we know Vlismus was always a dangerous fighter. She used her grappling a lot in that fight. And believe it or not, I think that McKenna can have success in this fight, not just kind of getting the better of the striking, maybe being a little bit more active, but actually avoiding the sub early on in this fight and then doing something uh, similar to what Sam Hughes did which if you guys don't remember, Sam Hughes had almost eight minutes of control time. So even though I think Sam Hughes lost that first round or was more competitive, then Sam Hughes took this fight over. I think that Corey McKenna could do something very similar in this spot here. I like Corey McKenna uh, to get the job done here. I feel more, more confident in her, even though Jacqueline is the Brazilian jiu-jitsu specialist and might have a slight edge there, at least early on. I think that McKenna is the better mixed martial artist. And as the fight progresses, I think that she'll just be um, more in the driver's seat as the fight goes on. So uh, I, I like being on the McKenna side here. Uh, uh, Corey McKenna, she's a minus 130 and my bookie opened up as a plus 130 underdog. So of course, action coming in on her. I was a little surprised to see her opening up as a dog in some of these books. Uh, let's take a look at what Bavada is talking about. Bavada had her as a plus 115 underdog. She's now minus 130 as well there. And I still have seen her as low. If you go on jazz sports, oh no, now she's even a minus 132. So really the, the line, the action is coming in on her. So the mass is kind of in agreement with what I'm seeing. Or we're kind of on the same page here. I was a little surprised to see that McKenna is the better mixed martial artist from what we've seen so far. You also take into consideration she's just 24. She's going to start physically maturing and she's going to be a fighter that really starts to hit her stride. I like Corey McKenna to get the job done. I will say that McKenna will win a decision. I'll say she kind of grinds out a decision, uh, but takes the fight over as Amorum doesn't have that early success and she doesn't find that sub. And this should be McKenna's fight as it goes on. To play devil's advocate though, if we're going to see the other scenario go down, maybe Jacqueline snatches up that sub. She's dangerous there. Maybe she gets a hold of that sub and gives Corey McKenna her first ever submission loss. Or if she continues to develop with her striking and she looks better in there, she's going to have a massive reach advantage. I think it's almost an entire foot of a reach advantage there in her arms, uh, a foot of a reach advantage in her arms. I like that there, but uh, maybe she could kind of strike from the outside and have some success. But I, I like McKenna. Now, this should be one of the more fun fights taking place on the card. Danny Silva, 27 years old. He's making his UFC debut here. Coming off what I said was the most exciting fight that we ever saw on Dana White's Contender Series. If you remember that fight, I mean, what a performance there. Uh, he's taking on Joshua Koulibau, a fighter that has really delivered over the past couple of years. Had a rough start in his debut, right? He got finished by Jalen Turner, who we know is a high-level opponent, but got finished in that debut. Since then, though, he's had a lot of success uh, in the cage and he has proved to be a UFC caliber fighter. Um, but back to Danny Silva, if you guys didn't uh, see that fight, I saw, of course I saw that live. You guys know I'm watching all these, uh, these fights live, but against Angel uh, Pacheco, right? That fight was ridiculous. Uh, took place in uh, September of last year. Angel Pacheco, extremely tough in his own right. And you got to give him credit because takes two to tango. He, he delivered uh, two to, uh, to take that onslaught by Danny Silva and kind of throw his own shots back here and there. But let's be very clear. Danny Silva was w a major step ahead 
uh, in the striking. I was very impressed. I like the defensive skills he showed at times, although he did get caught up in just kind of playing the game. I think that if he really wanted to, he could have avoided being landed on as much as he was because he was landed on as well. Um, I mean, you take a look at the stats from that fight. It was ridiculous. Uh, he landed 13.6 strikes per minute, but absorbed 13.13. But again, the head movement is there, man. When he really wants to, I think he has the skills. I think that he just felt confident that he could uh, he could eat some of those shots and then he was trying to find his finish there and he was trying to put on a show, you know, Dana White's contender series and all that. But I'm hoping that he tones it down a little bit and starts to, you know, feel feel comfortable being a UFC fighter and doesn't feel that he has to just go out there and go balls to the wall every time. He needs to slow things down a little bit and start to kind of rely on his skills just to, uh, you know, to take the the more intelligent route to victory. Uh, Joshua Koulibau, a very dangerous striker in his own regard, but I would say that Danny Silva is a little bit sharper uh, from a technical standpoint. I, I'm going to edge him as far as the striking goes. I think he's going to show up here and just be a slight tick ahead of Koulibau. I like what I've seen from Silva. He's extremely tough. We've never seen him finished. I mean, you saw the shots he was eating too. It's ridiculous. And throughout his career, he's been extremely durable and tough through nine pro fights so far. Um, Joshua Koulibau, uh, he's been finished once. We've seen him crumble in the second round against Jalen Turner. Uh, so, so we've seen that. Not to say that Koulibau is not a tough dude as well, but we've seen him crumble. Danny Silva, from what we've seen from him so far, uh, you know, he's, he's looking like uh, Marlon Chito Vera out there. Right? Vera has to be Right now, he, Vera, by the way, is on the Mount Rushmore as far as durability goes. After that knee he took from O'Malley, just never being finished. Oof. But uh, Danny Silva has that type of potential. We'll see how his career progresses. But the durability, it's looked pretty good. Um, and I think these guys are going to go to war. And I think that I'm going to edge Silva there. I am. I'm going to edge him in his UFC debut. All right. So, and this is a, a steep uh, debut. This is a, a, a very solid step up in competition for Danny Silva. So we will see how he performs. Um, but I'm going to say there's there's a likelihood that Danny Silva can find the finish in this fight because they're going to be trading. And when you're going to war like that, somebody can easily fall. There's a, there is a likelihood that we see a KO finish here for Danny Silva or they go to a decision. And it's just an absolute war. Also take note, Danny Silva training over there in California with guys like Dan Argueta, uh, a couple other uh, of tough guys. Uh, some of those guys' names slip in my mind right now, but I know he, he he gets it in over there, man. This guy really puts in some serious work. Uh, I've heard you know talks about his work ethic and just the guys he surrounds himself with. He, he's taking this really serious. Not to say Cooley Bell's not, but I think Danny Silva is going to be a UFC fighter for some time to come. So I, I like him here, and uh, we'll see how that fight takes place. And remember, we're going to be talking about some prop bets uh, on the, the prop video here, but I will, I'll pick Danny Silva via KO, second round, third round KO, to the lightweight division. This is another fighter here, Mitch Ramirez, who I'm very excited for, for him to make his UFC debut. I'm very excited to witness this. Uh, he's taking on Tiago Moises. Uh, we got to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but Mitch Ramirez, uh, I've mentioned before, if you guys forgot, but this is a dude that DM'd me after I did a post about how he was kind of removed, or he was removed from the Ultimate Fighter House when Conor McGregor was making room for some of his boys there. He just shot me a DM. He, he kind of appreciated the post that I did. I was kind of saying it was messed up, and next thing you know, me and him are going back and forth. I've had that happen a couple times with some fighters. It's, it's kind of cool when it happens, and uh, it seems that he just wanted to kind of vent. He even told me some stuff that I really wasn't supposed to uh, repeat, which I didn't, and I still won't, but uh, you know, this, he really opened up to me. Cool-ass dude. Uh, and then you know what? He gets that opportunity after that whole situation went down where he didn't really know what, what was going to happen from that. Cause he was vocal about not being happy about that, that situation. And he wasn't sure if the UFC was gonna, you know, just kind of say, Oh yeah, well to hell with you. But you know, the UFC did look out for him. They gave him that opportunity. That's exactly what I told Mitch at the time too. I said that through DMS. I said, Hey man, I, I bet you if I know Dana White and the UFC brass, what they're going to do is they're going to give you some solid opportunities moving forward for what, for how you got pushed to the side. And that's kind of exactly what has happened, right? Think about this. Now they didn't do him, do him any favors with the matchmaking, but he got a, a main event headline spot on Dana White's contender series card. So he had that opportunity there and he did fall short and he was matched up against an absolute killer, uh, you know, a fighter in, uh, a very nasty uh, Brazilian striker and Carlos Pratis, who now has another knockout victory after that, uh, you know, fighting in the UFC, just had that knockout victory against Trevin Giles, a uh, UFC veteran. Uh, but, you know, he had that opportunity. And then the UFC, uh, now they give him a contract here. And I'll tell you what I think is going on, just so you guys know. Uh, Tiago Moises was supposed to be initially uh, facing off with Brad Riddell, 
who was coming back out of retirement. Brad Riddell now pulls out of this fight. Um, but so, so they give Mitch Ramirez a contract. He's taken on Tiago Moises. And what, what I feel very strongly in is that even if Mitch Ramirez loses this fight, taking it on short notice, he will get another opportunity. And I bet you it'll be a much uh, easier opponent than a Tiago Moises because Moises is a very tough fighter to make your, your debut on. Okay. Tiago Moises is a fighter that is, you take a look at his losses, losses. It's only been against the best, uh, especially over, over the last plenty of years, uh, lost to, uh, you know, uh, Benoit St. Denis, uh, Joel Alvarez, Islam Makashev, uh, you know, Demir Ismagulov, the Va the Wagner, uh, Rocha, that was a grappling match, but Tiago Moises is a high caliber grappler submitted my boy, Christos Giagos, uh, Mel Costa, uh, defeated Alexander Hernandez, Bobby Green, Michael Johnson, submitted Michael Johnson. I mean, he's a legitimate fighter, man. He's been grinding over at America Top Team for a long time. And even though he's the UFC veteran here, Tiago Moises is just 28 years old. I mean, he, his his body uh, is still uh, still fresh. He's not an aged fighter, even though he has a good amount of fights. He's still 28 years old. While Mitch Ramirez, um, you know, he doesn't have as much mileage on him, which is nine pro fights, but he's actually the older fighter by three years. He's 30 years old here. And, um, I'm I'm rooting for my boy Mitch here, man. I really hope Mitch prevails here. And he follows me on IG and he, he likes some of my posts and whatnot. And I'm pretty sure he's going to see my, my official picks when I do it. And sometimes, you know, that's the nature of the business. It's not easy to do, but I got to go with Tiago Moises here. I, I, I just kind of have to. The more I analyze tape, I think there is an, an avenue for Mitch Ramirez to get the job done. He, I would prefer him to keep this fight standing, avoid going to the mat at all cost, and, you know, try to use uh, some some of his striking to get the better of Moises. But Moises isn't a slouch there. He has nasty calf kicks, and his striking has came around over over the years. So, um, you know, and, and it's also, uh, I also want to note, Mitch Ramirez, after taking that loss on Dana White's contender series, he had a, another fight since then and got a nice first round uh, victory over a 5-0 and up-and-comer, uh, the hyphy kid there. So, um, Mitch Ramirez is the truth. And I think that he has all the potential to hang around in this fight and potentially get the job done. But when it's all said and done, I got to I got to side with Tiago Moises here, man. The, the grappling uh, avenue is, is is could be there. The sub threat uh, could be there. And then even on the feet, we'll see how that all plays out. Uh, we've seen Mitch Ramirez, you know, in the practice fight, he took some damage. Um, watch the calf kicks of... Uh, Tiago Moises. Moises right now on my bookie is a minus 400. He opened up as a minus 375. Now, I'm not in agreement with the line movement here, and I think that's a very steep line. I think the value is on Mitch Ramirez. If any of you guys are looking for some underdog value on this card, already where it's at, at plus 260, I think there's a lot of value there. All right. And you guys know I've been targeting value um, on some of these, these underdogs, right? I've been cashing in on some of them as of recently. Of course, I hit that huge plus 500 uh, dog, even caught it as high as plus 550 uh, by the time the fight kicked off. Uh, and Sahabi, but uh, this is another fight where there's value on the dog. I, I think that Ramirez is live to, to be game here, but all in all, I will edge Moises to get the job done and uh, be careful for the sub. Be careful of the sub if he gets on Ramirez. Ramirez is no slouch as a grappler, but Moises is high level. We got more solid up and coming talent here in the flyweight division to speak on. Jafel Filio is taking on Ode Osborne. Uh, Jafel. Uh, trading out of uh, Nova Uniao. He's a fighter that had a big time performance on Dana White's contender series. He's shown that typical Nova style, man. This is a dude that he's well-rounded. He has nasty sub skills, but he'll also go out there and he'll trade with you and he'll he'll clip you. Uh, we saw that on Dana White's contender series initially where he knocked out uh, Robert Echeverria, who's actually a tough fighter. He was undefeated at the time and he since bounced back with another victory. He got a finish over an opponent there. He's a tough customer. Uh, I've heard good things about Echeverria. Uh, now he lost... Uh, Jafel did lose his UFC debut, but he was matched up against Mohamed Makayev, uh, you know, one of the top up and, uh, I wouldn't call him a top up and coming fighter, but a, a top, one of the top talents, one of the top young, talented fighters in the game, right? That was a tough loss for him, got finished in the third round. Uh, but then he bounced back with a nice sub over Daniel Barrez, pulled off that arm triangle choke. All right. So Jafel is a well-rounded fighter. And, uh, and you could say the same thing about Ode for the most part, but I think there's going to be a grappling edge here uh, for Jafel. I think as the fight pro progresses and if it goes down to the mat, I like the Brazilian jiu-jitsu skills of Jafel more so than Ode. I know Ode is a fighter that pulled off an armbar uh, back when he fought on Dana White's contender series a long time ago uh, on one of the earlier uh, seasons there. I know he has some grappling abilities, but I still Jafel, I still feel Jafel is the more polished uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu player. I think that Ode will want to keep this fight standing uh, where he will have 
uh, about a four and a half inch reach advantage over Filio. Uh, Ode Osborne is a an explosive, quick twitch athlete type of fighter, um, but he's just had a lot of ups and downs throughout his career, and he's a fighter that I really can't bake on uh, these days. I've, I've been a little bit disappointed in some of the performances that he's had as of recently. Um, I put some faith in him at times, and he really uh, did, didn't deliver, or I, I felt like his performances weren't they weren't translating like they should have. I thought we were seeing some evolution from him and then he takes a step back and back. And um, I'm going to be taking the Brazilian here. I think that he just shows to be, uh, may, I don't know if I want to say him. Yeah, I guess I, we could say it. Maybe he just shows to be a more promising fighter. I think the peak of a Jafel Filio will be uh, better than anything we've ever saw from Ode Osborne. And, and I don't mean to be too harsh on Ode because he's had his moments, right? Uh, he eked out a decision victory over Charles Johnson. Johnson loses a lot of fights and Johnson took that fight on short notice. So, um, you know, he was knocked out by Tyson Nam. Uh, you know, he knocked out Zaruk Adeshev, the kickboxer who, uh, was a flake of an MMA fighter. If we want to be honest, you know, victory over CJ Vergara, who's not really showing to be anything got knocked out by Manil Cape. That was a fight where he had some early success and then he got clipped himself. So, um, he got knocked out by Jerome, or excuse me, he knocked out Jerome Rivera. You guys know I have Rivera on my Mount Rushmore for the worst UFC careers of all time. So when you really dive into his his resume, I think that Jafel Filio would have had a lot of success in, in within those fights as well. So I think that I like Filio here. I do. I like him here. He's a well-rounded fighter, and I think he'll hold his own. So give me the Nova Unyao product and Jafel Filio. Who is he's currently a minus one ninety favorite. He opened up as a minus one fifty. The way this line is trending, uh, I'm not feeling there's too much value on it, and it's almost pushing me to a point where I got to say that there's more value on the Ode Osborne uh, plus one fifty betting line. Not sure if I'm quite there at the moment, but the way it's trending, if it gets if it moves any more, so I'm going to feel that way. Um, but but I like Jafael Filio to get the job done here. I think he can find a finish potentially. Uh, even if it goes to the judges scorecards, I think he could be a step ahead. Um, we'll see how it plays out. Just remember, Ode is, is tricky. He's explosive, fights out of that southpaw stance, and he does throw some some heavy shots. So um, there is potential he can crack Filio too. And um, e either man can get cracked with a shot. It's a fun fight. I'm excited for this fight. Give me Jafael Filio to get the job done. And I will say, uh, you know, let's take a look real quick. You know, Half of Ode's losses have come by way of submission. Remember when he got submitted by one of my arch nemesis, Brian Kelleher? You guys know I got Kevin Hall and, and Brian Kelleher. I never, uh, I never give, give in. I, I once I hold a grudge, it's forever. So uh, you know Kelleher pulled a sub on, on Ode. Ode dropped the ball there. I think that Fiolio can pull a sub within 15 minutes of this fight. But stay tuned for that prop video. We'll talk about something maybe we're targeting here. Hey guys, it would mean a lot to me if you could slide over to my IG, MMA Fortune Teller underscore, and give me a follow. Promise you guys will be pumping out all types of dope content uh, for you there if you guys are on IG. And if you're on Twitter as well, I'm on Twitter at the MMA Teller, and uh, you'll see all types of dope posts like this. Uh, it means a lot to me. I'm trying to grow uh, my social media, and it's a great way to keep in touch with me uh, throughout the week. You see me on the beach over here and whatnot. It's a great way to, to keep in touch with me uh, in between the, the week as we, we pump this video out to you. But I want to network with you guys all throughout the week. So go give me a follow, please. Interestingly enough, we're talking some ranked bantamweight action over here on the woman's side of things. And, and I say it's interesting because both of these fighters are relatively new to the UFC, but that kind of shows you the depth of the bantamweight division uh, in the in the women's side of things. But, uh, you know, not to say that these fighters aren't good fighters. Jossie Ann Nunez, I've been very pleased to watch her, her fight. This is a fighter that has some nasty striking. She has some serious pop in her hands. Uh, I would say she she has some of the better power that we see in all of women's mixed martial arts. Uh, Chelsea Chandler, an extremely tough fighter who has her own little intriguing backstory, you know, fighting at a Stockton and, and training with fighters like, like Nate Diaz and whatnot. And she kind of has that, that vibe when she fights in the cage. Um, you know, she's a well-rounded fighter, has some grappling. Uh, she's willing to duke it out on the feet, uh, has a little bit of a Nate Diaz face as well. So th that, that was kind of a, you know, a cool little backstory uh, that she had as she came in and made her UFC debut and uh, went in there and smashed Storlyanko. Now I will say this, I've been a fighter that it has really, Excuse me, I'm, I was a fighter at one point in time to an extent, not really, but you know, I, I've 
as a fighter, I haven't been the biggest fan of Storylianko. Okay, uh, I, I, and a lot of you guys have. I would say that. I mean, I remember a lot of you guys raving about Storylianko going into that uh, that Luana Carolina fight. You guys know we just cash on that. That was an official play in Luana Carolina. But the point I'm bringing that up for is that uh, Storylianko is a fighter that has some nasty Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu skills. But other than that, I'm not a big fan on her as a mixed martial artist. Chelsea Chandler has good grappling. She was able to avoid being subbed, and she was able to land some big shots in the feed and finish Storylianko up there. But I don't put too much stock into that fit, that finish there. Um, she bounced back with a, a pretty disappointing performance over Norma Dumont. Norma Dumont, not only did she outstrike her, she controlled Chandler down in the mat for almost nine minutes. Okay. I mean, she had a lot of control time. So, you know, we've heard a little bit about Chandler's grappling and whatnot, but wasn't too, looking too sharp there. Um, now, Jose Ann Nunez is obviously a striking first fighter. I think that she has a clear edge as these girls duke it out. I, I feel... Nunez uh, is going to hold her own and it could really have success there. If you want to argue that Chandler has maybe a, an edge in this fight or potentially has an edge, I think she needs to get this fight down to the mat and try to show us some of those grappling skills that, that we uh, have heard that she learned over there in, in the 209 over there in Stockton, training with the Diaz brothers and those types of people, uh, you know, training under Gracie and all that. Um, but I like Jose and Nunez here. I think Jose, Jose and Nunez is going to show up. I think that Jose and Nunez is a fighter that's just going to look better and better as she rounds out her overall game. She's 10 and one as a pro. Her only loss uh, came by way uh, of Talia Santos. She went to a decision with uh, T Talia Santos, uh, Tal Talia Santos, however, you know, that the first name is a little bit tricky there. I want to call her Talia, Talia, whatever you guys are going to give me hell in the comment section. You guys, you guys got nothing better to do, but uh, you know, besides that loss, now, knocked out Bea Malecki in her UFC debut. Uh, looked very good against Ramona Pasquale and uh, looked good against Zara Farin in her last fight. I know that's not the most stacked uh, level of competition there, but she passes the eye test when you watch her fight. She's like a little badger. Reminds me of one of those little uh, honey badgers. So that she's tough. And I'm going to side with her over Chelsea Chandler. And this is another fight where I got to pick against a fighter that follows me in IG and who has shown love, uh, you know, liking some of my stuff and whatnot. It is what it is. You guys know we got to keep it professional here. Chelsea Chandler is probably going to see that I picked against her. It is what it is. I got to go with Jose and Nunez here. Um, let's take a look at the betting line. Jose and Nunez opened up as a minus 130. She's now minus 155. So slight movement going her way. And that that's kind of what, I've, I, what I expected. I think when you watch tape on both these fighters, um, I think Nunez would look better. And keep an eye too. Uh, on this fight, both fighters fighting out of the southpaw stance. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see how they clash on the feet. Chandler is tough. She'll march forward. But I think Nunez uh, can have success with the, that nice straight left hand down the pipe. And, and Nunez changes stances as well, too. She's diverse with her striking attack. I think she'll be ahead, a step ahead and just needs to keep the fight standing. And uh, she'll, she'll be good there. So I like Jose and Nunez. Um, I think the fight most likely goes to a decision where Nunez is just a step ahead. Look who's making his return to the octagon, Mike Davis. You guys remember I chatted it up with Mike Davis three years ago. Uh, it was. He was a very intriguing character. And uh, if you guys follow him on social media, I mean, he's a fighter that has been very active on social media and in and, and the, the social media world, if you will, in a variety of ways. Uh, even though he hasn't been active as a fighter, he's a fighter uh, that hasn't really just disappeared. Uh, but it hasn't surprised me that he hasn't been as active as he has because i specifically asked him when i interviewed him too because even back then he wasn't that active and i was kind of asking him what's going on or you know when do you want to get back in there and he had just no sense of urgency to step back into the cage so um you know his last fight took place back in 2022 um and it's been a while man and his fights have been very spaced out i mean look at this 2022 to 2021 to 2019 i mean he's hardly averaging a fight per year uh, and it's a shame because he's a very talented fighter uh, his last victory was over Slava Borishev, who's looked very good. Uh, Mason Jones is a good fighter. Uh, knocked out Thomas Gifford. I saw that fight live. His uh, lone loss, really, it, it was lone loss in the UFC. We could talk about the Dana White's Contender Series fight, but it was against Gilbert Burns, who was really at his peak around that time, too. No shame in that that loss there. May have even taken that fight on short notice. I forget. Um, but, and then he had that loss against Sadiq Yusuf, who's a very talented fighter. And that was a fight where they went tit for tat. One of the, one of the, uh, top bangers that we've ever saw on Dana White's Contender Series at that time. It was one of the earlier seasons, and those guys really went at it. Mike Davis was the slight favorite in that fight, and that's where Sadiq, Sadiq Yusuf really made a name for himself. But we instantly knew when we were watching that fight that both of those fighters 
were legitimate UFC caliber fighters. If you know what you're watching, you're watching uh, the technique of, of both those fighters. They, they were very, very skilled. And uh, Mike Davis is still 31. So I'm hoping that he looks to step on the gas here and really try to make a run in this division because he has all the talent in the world. Um, and, and there's a reason why, even with the long layoff, that the UFC is throwing him right back in there with a guy like Nathan Levy, who is a dangerous dude. It's because they know what Mike Davis brings to the table. Uh, I found this fun, kind of funny. Uh, on the UFC uh, website, they, they took all the stats down on Mike Davis. You can't even pull him up because he just has he's been so inactive. They probably just don't even uh, maybe they thought he retired. I don't know what went on, but they, they took all the stats down. Uh, so we can't really look too too much into that. But just understand that Mike Davis is a very well-rounded fighter. Uh, he will go the wrestling route if he needs to. He will get some control time on you. He'll go that route. He's an intelligent fighter. He can more than hold his own on the feet striking. Uh, Natan Levy is a good striker as well. Has a beautiful uh, body kick that he throws from, from his power leg there. Um, but I think that Mike Davis will counter that with some boxing shots. I think he'll be a step ahead. I think he's the better athlete. And I think that Mike Davis goes out here and gets the job done. Uh, Natan Levy is a fighter that has never been finished uh, as a pro so far in nine fights. He's shown to be pretty durable. Wouldn't be shocked, though, if Davis clips him. He has some serious hands. Seven knockout victories out of his 10 victories there. He is a fight finisher. Um, we'll see how that, that plays out. But all in all, there's potential that Levy can hang around and make this a competitive fight. I like Mike Davis. If he shows up and he looks to be the Mike Davis that we, we knew and that we've always known, he is the better fighter here. The question mark that you can kind of bring up to the table is with the inactivity, how is he going to look? Is he the same dude? Okay. In the meantime, while he's out there doing whatever he's doing, Natan Levy has been very active. All right. He, and he's been putting in work. Um, you know, he hasn't had a fight in a little bit actually as well, but he fought in 2022. It's, it's actually been a little bit for him, uh, but he's been much more active than Mike Davis. And realistically, that he had a, a nice little three fight stretch there. The Rafa Garcia fight, he showed up in that fight. That was his UFC debut. Uh, he lost. I think it was a split decision, or if not, it was a very closely contested match. I know because I had an official play on Rafa Garcia and I was biting my nails as they went to the, the, the scorecards. Uh, so he, he looked good there and, uh, you know, got two nice victories after that. But look to lower level fighters, Mike Breeden and Gennaro Valdez. But I think that Natan Levy is probably more involved in the fight game mentally than a Mike Davis, but I'm going to say that Mike Davis shows up and uh, he he's, he's ready to, to uh, put in some work and look at the betting line here. He is currently a minus three fifty favorite. So people are really not worried about the layoff. They know that he's just a better fighter uh, from a skill set uh, standpoint and open up as a minus two ninety heavy action coming in on him. Um, if it's in the minus 400s, I think you're really stretching. So be careful if you're throwing that in parlays. That, that is a stretch. Uh, but I like Davis here. That's a steep line, man. Levy's is not a bad fighter. Uh, I, I don't have too much to say on that line, man. If you got, What do you want me to say about that? Uh, I think Mike Davis is a better fighter. Should go out there and show up. Uh, we'll talk maybe about a knockout prop. We'll analyze that line. But that's you're going to throw that in a parlay on a guy that has barely is averaging a fight a year. Not even averaging a fight a year. I don't know about that. I'll sit back. I'll root on my boy there. He's a great dude, and I hope he gets the job done. Some solid matchmaking here. Gerald Mearshart taking on Brian Barberena. Fights taking place in the middleweight division. I think when when these fighters saw who they were facing, I think both of them kind of had the same reaction. They probably were like, Oof, uh, you know, I'm not getting thrown in there uh, with, with another killer. Because as of recently, that's really who they've been fighting against. And uh, it's probably more so in the case of Gerald. Uh, as we'll get to the betting line, Gerald is the favorite, and, and I think he is more pleased to be fighting a Brian Barberena maybe than vice versa. But still, uh, Gerald Mearshart, uh been taking a couple L's as of recently, but went to a split decision against Andre Petrosky, uh, lost to Joseph Pfeiffer, who you guys know is dangerous as hell. I know he just took a loss, but he still, he showed his skill set in that fight. He's dangerous. Uh, before that, he got a submission victory over Bruno Silva, who's no joke. All right, so, uh, you know, the Bruno Silva fight, and the Dustin Stolzfist, both those victories looking pretty damn good. Even the Mahmoud Muradov victory, all three of those victories looking pretty damn good uh, for Mearshart, especially after what he went through in that comms that fight. He bounced back in such a major way after taking that, that knockout loss. Uh, it took just 17 seconds for comms at the start. Shum, you guys all remember the fight. And since then, man, submitting guys like Bartos Fabinski, Mahmoud Muradov, Dustin Stolzfus, who Stolzfus has been looking really good. Bruno Silva uh, fought a, a closely contested match against Petrosky. I think Mearshart has put out a, a good product of himself over these past couple of years. He's a good fighter, well-rounded. He's tough, but he's more of a jiu-jitsu guy. 
He has a big frame too. He knows what to do with it. Uh, he'll have a massive five inch reach advantage here. Brian Barbarena is game. He's always tough. And uh, these are the guys he's been getting matched up with, right? RDA, Gunnar Nelson, Makman Muradov. Uh, and then you got to go back to the, the Robbie Lawler uh, victory that he had, which I know Robbie ended his career with a nice knockout victory, but still we know that Robbie was a little bit of a shell of himself. The Matt Brown split decision victory. I thought Matt Brown should have got the nod there. And Matt Brown very much up in age at the time. Uh, and then the Darian Weeks victory. So uh, I know I don't put too much stock into his victories. Uh, I think he's a fun fighter to watch, but I don't think he has a lot of big no, uh, notable victories as far as the level of opposition. I like Gerald Mearshard here. I think this should be a very fun fight. And granted, Gerald doesn't make a... a blatant mistake on the feet and get clipped by a power shot from Brian Barbarina because Barbarina will put some oomph into his, his punches and maybe he clips him. We've seen Marsh, Mar Mearshart start slow a little bit and get clipped before. Other than that, though, once the train is chugging along, I think Mearshart will be a step ahead in this fight. Uh, this fight should be a very fun fight, but uh, I like Gerald Mearshart here uh, to get the job done. I think this is a a, a really solid matchup for him. And uh, you see him, he's been putting in work over at Team Killcliffe. Which you see a lot of fighters, um, there's definitely some type of uh, rapport between Team Killcliffe and uh, Team Rufus Sport. You see a lot of uh, fighters bouncing back and forth from those gyms, and those are two high-level gyms. And uh, Mearshart should be hitting on all cylinders here. I like him <clears throat> to get the job done. Uh, you know, he is uh, obviously a fight finisher when it comes to his sub skills. Uh, Brian Barbarina has been subbed three times out of his eleven losses. Hasn't really shown to be too deficient there. Uh, maybe this fight goes to the judges' scorecards and Mearshart is just a step ahead, but Mearshart is a, a nasty submission player. So uh, he opened up as a minus 160 favorite. He's now a minus 260. Heavy action coming in on him. Um, I think the masses kind of just see this fight playing out. I think that we see this fight like kind of playing out. These guys chugging along in the cage. It's fun to watch, but Mearshart being a step ahead. So um, obviously you, you want that line better than a 260. You wanted to be on it earlier. That's at least how I feel, but if you guys must, if you guys feel like you need to have action on this fight, I would still be on the Mearshart side of things. I would. I um, think you could still throw him in a parlay even right now if you feel like you need to have action on this fight. Um, I think he I think gets the job done. We got a rematch set to take place here in the women's bantamweight division. Uh, Macy Chase on won the first time around against Penny Kianza via submission. Um, both these fighters ranked in the top 10 of the bantamweight division. Um, not a lot of people know this, uh, but it, some of you guys do that really pay close attention. But Macy Chase on was actually where we got the term giraffe syndrome from. So if that doesn't give you an idea of who, what her style is at the cage, I mean, she was actually uh, the first fighter that we ever uh, regarded giraffe syndrome to. Uh, shout out to everybody who knows about the giraffe syndrome. Uh, but she's worked on her giraffe syndrome and uh, she's gotten a little bit sharper and a little bit more uh, agile and whatnot, bringing a little bit of that, that tiger syndrome into her, her skill set. Uh, you know, I'm just joking, joking with you guys a bit here, man, but you guys know what I'm saying, man. Early on in her career, uh, she just was a little, a little goofy. She has solid power, but she moved, she moved a little bit in a goofy way. And, um, she's became more of an athlete throughout the years, I would say, and she's became a much better mixed martial artist. She's a good fighter. Um, it's hard to, to forget the performance that she had where she was a huge favorite against Lena Landsberg and really dropped the ball. She was controlled against the cage for the vast majority of that fight. Uh, but since that loss, you know, took out Shana Young and Marion Renault via decision, got submitted by Raquel Pennington and knocked out by Irene Aldana in two of her last three fights, but actually snuck in a decision victory over Norma Dumont, which is not easy to do. Okay. And also note, even though she has those mental miscues in the cage at times, she was actually up against up on Irene Aldana before getting hit in the liver there. Um, which that took place in the third round with just uh, what about three and a half minutes left in that fight. So that was very disappointing for her. That was that, that tricky one. If you guys remember, it's like the ref didn't even know what was going on. But uh, uh, you know, Irene was like, oh, did I win? It was a weird one. But uh, Irene did catch her with that up kick to the liver. Besides those mental miscues she has in the cage, I mean, she's a good fighter. Uh, she, she, she really is. She's, a, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of hers, but she's a good fighter. Um, and I think she can go out here and get another victory over Penny Kianzad. Kianzad's a good fighter as well. Uh, she's a very a decision type of fighter. All right. She doesn't have a lot of finishes. In fact, out of 16 of her wins, she has two finishes, two knockouts. That's it. She's never had a submission. All right. So that's the reason why I'm feeling more confident in Macy too, because I just don't see that hiccup happening, happening in the cage. I don't see Penny 
having a moment where she does something to really shake things up. And you really kind of have to do that against Macy. Otherwise, Macy will, will be a step ahead here. And I also don't see Panny being the type of fighter that's going to try to control Macy with the grappling and, and push her up against the cage. Um, Panny's a fighter that, that favors her Muay Thai skills and her striking and will try to entertain that type of affair. And I think Macy Chase on will just be a step ahead here. Um, I, I like Macy Chase on to get another victory uh, over Panny Kianza. Now, uh, Macy Chase on is currently a minus 220 on my bookie. Big action coming her way. Open up as a minus 170, but you would have had to grab that line uh, over a month ago. Let's let's be clear there as well. It's not like the line just changed, but um, I like Macy Chase on here. Anything, even for where it's at, I would still edge her. Um, I'm going to say that she wins a decision this time around, uh, but but I, I, I like her even. I don't know. What should I say here, guys? I mean, don't don't. Get out of hand with this line. Don't let it go any more so. And realistically, you probably want it at least under minus 200, if you're being honest. I mean, you might be really reaching at a 220 line. I just feel Macy's going to show up and get the job done. But it is a women's fight that could play out closely. Maybe we see a little tit for tat here. Maybe Kianza keeps this fight standing and she has some success with her Muay Thai skills and it goes to a split decision. So maybe you shouldn't be targeting that. Maybe I should be more, uh, more responsible where I lead you guys. I think Macy gets the job done, though. All right, so I'm not going to really scare you guys away from doing something with that. Try to get it, though, minus 190 and down. See if you could shop some lines. Uh, I mean, she really is, though, in the minus 200s at this point. Uh, she's a minus 200 flat on bet US. No, no, no. The line just changed uh, very recently. Today, she went from a 200 to a 235. So action coming in just as we've been recording this. So I don't know. You might be too late on that one, too. So as we jump into this Christian Rodriguez versus Isaac Dalgarian fight, check this out real quick. It's kind of hitting me right now and it's kind of interesting. So, I mean, I have a handful or, you know, a couple UFC fighters that follow me and show a little love. I've been talking about that. This is very weird to me, though. Uh, I, don't, I don't have an overwhelming amount of fighters that follow me. I have some, but uh, this card, it's like almost all the fighters that follow me or show me love are all on this uh on this fight card, it's actually kind of tripping me out as I think about this. Gregorio, uh, we did pick him. We'll, we'll go over who we picked and who we didn't pick because we're going to talk about another fighter here in a second who follows me and has commented and has liked some of my posts. We'll see if I'm picking him, though. Uh, Gregorio, um, uh, let's see here. Mitch Ramirez, we talked about Mitch Ramirez. Uh, Chelsea Chandler, Mike Davis. Um, Isaac Dalgarian is going to be the next one we talk about. And then Brian Battle, of course, my boy, too. So we got like six fighters, man, that follow me here. So it's kind of trippy because, you know, they're all going to see my picks and I haven't been really picking a lot of them. Uh, let's see. Am I going to be picking Isaac Delgarian? Because Isaac Delgarian does follow me. And, uh, you know, he was an official play of mine. Did a little post about him. I guess he, he kind of appreciated the post I did. He shot me a follow. And, um, you know, he's a stud of a fighter. This is a, a high level fight here for two youngsters. These are two serious up and coming fighters here. Isaac Dalgarian taking on Christian Rodriguez. Um, Isaac Dalgarian just had that big victory over Francis Marshall. Uh, went out there, got the first round knockout. That was an official play of mine. I took him to win via KO as well. I had two bets locked in that, that felt very good there. I remember celebrating, uh, just very recently there. That fight took place, uh, towards the end of last year. And, uh, you know, I'll say this much Francis Marshall, not a bad fighter, but he's not a Christian Rodriguez. Uh, Christian Rodriguez is a much more fluid fighter, Christian Rodriguez is a, a fighter that is, uh, he, he's just a much more mature fighter, even though he's a young, younger fighter in the game. He's been surrounding himself with, with some of the top level talent through, for years since he was a young kid. He's been surrounding himself with, with dudes like Anthony Pettis and, and the whole Rufus team. And, uh, you know, even when, when Pettis was the champion and they had so much buzz going on over there. So he knows the game, man. And you see it in his performances. He's so calm, cool, and collected, well-rounded. I mean, you saw what he did to Raul Rosas Jr., uh, completely uh, derailed that hype train there. And, um, you know, this is another opportunity for C-Rod to do something similar like that. Uh, Isaac Delgarian has the wrestling pedigree. He's a very talented wrestler. He's an explosive athlete. You saw him, you know, he'll land big shots. He'll knock you out. He's a fight finisher. Um, the question marks I have in regards to Delgarian here, you know, when you have to pick a side here, is that Delgarian doesn't have a lot of... of a fight time, a lot of pro fight time. Look at all these first round finishes, right? You, you go back to his last fight and then you, we scroll down first round, knockout, first round, knockout, first round, sub, first round, knockout, first round, sub, first round, knockout. A lot of these earlier fights also were against lower level talent. All right. I, I know that 
thoroughly because I remember just diving into him because I, I was going to hammer that Marshall play and I, I liked what I was seeing, but I understood it was against lower level talent and I kind of just, uh, you know, you got to kind of just gauge it uh, for what it is and make a decision there. Now, this is different. Christian Rodriguez is a fighter. He has 11 pro fights. He's just 26 years old, but he's been in that gym for a long time and has victories over fighters like Cameron S Simon, who's a very talented young fighter. Uh, Raul Rosas Jr., the very talented young kid. Um, you know, the one fight that he really took in Ellen, uh, dating back for a long time or throughout his entire career, you know, if that, I mean, at that, uh, was Jonathan Pierce. So Jonathan Pierce is a very talented grappler, and Jonathan Pierce outworked him and out wrestled him in that fight. That was his UFC debut. Uh, Pierce was a much more mature fighter and C Rod learned from that experience. We've seen his grappling getting better and better. And JSP is just no joke. So understand that. And let's also note, uh, he knocked out my boy, uh, Shara Lampos, Gregorio, uh, took Reyes Cortez to a decision. Uh, he has a couple you know, respectable victories and, and just, you know, he's been in there with some names you recognize and he's gone the distance. So he, I think he's a much more trustworthy fighter here. And, um, I think he's going to be using his jab and I think he doesn't get finished early. And once he doesn't get finished early, the fight will progress and we'll have to uh, see how Dolgarian looks later on in fights. I could I could expect him maybe to be breathing heavier, not managing his cardio as much as Christian Rodriguez. Christian Rodriguez knows how to manage his cardio. The way he moves in there, man, he's breathing just very uh, fluently throughout the fight. He's not getting over uh, overzealous and, and getting worked up in certain positions. If Dolgarian wants to push him up against the cage, C-Rod will relax there. He'll, he'll pace himself. He'll just, uh, let Dolgarian work himself out. And then he'll, he'll maneuver out of that. He'll start pumping the jab and he'll mix things up. And don't be surprised if he hops on the back, maybe pulls off the sub or just gets the better of the striking as the fight progresses. So I am on C-Rod. Dolgarian's going to see the pick and it is what it is. I am on C-Rod too. Uh, get the job done here. And I say that he's potentially live to get a finish because uh, we don't know how Delgarian is going to look in the later rounds. And sometimes these fighters that have never been deep, they, they panic and uh, maybe he gets submitted. So keep an eye on that. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we do the prop edition. But uh, Christian Rodriguez is a plus 160 right now. Opened up as a plus 120. Touch minus 105 there for a second. It was almost pick him. And then everyone is slamming Delgarian. So people are very high on him. I get it. I like the kid. But I like Christian Rodriguez a little bit better at this point in time. Okay, so I like C-Rod. I think the value is on C-Rod at underdog odds without a doubt, especially at plus 160. And um, let's see if he can get a finish or if he would just be a step ahead throughout this fight. And uh, to play devil's advocate, just know Delgarian's an explosive athlete that will be looking for the finish early on in the fight. We're all the way at the top of this card, and uh, we got a little bit of uh, an interesting matchup here. Um I mean, it should be a fun one. I guess we expect to see a knockout or something. So I guess that's why it's at the top of this card. But uh, Kennedy uh, Zachuku taking on O. Vincent Pru, OSP. Uh, OSP is now 40 years old. So, uh, I mean, he still wants to step in the cage. I mean, props to him. But uh, I think he's going to be outgunned here. Now, if OSP is going to get the job done, I'm going to tell you guys very clearly how it has to be done. He needs to clip Kennedy uh, with a, a counter hook some type of counter strike and shake Kennedy up. We've seen Kennedy finish before out of his four losses. He's been finished uh, in three of them and uh, he's been hurt in all three of those fights. So um, OSP is the type of fighter that can, that can knock you out. We've seen him do that throughout the years, but he's just not the same version of himself. Uh, not only has he been, not been knocking fighters out, he's actually been getting knocked out uh, quite a bit. Just got knocked out by Jamal Hill, Tanner Bozier, uh, Felipe Linz. Uh, snuck in a split decision victory over the aged uh, Shogun Hua before he retired. Now he had that knockout victory over Alonzo Menafield. That was that was the big one for him over the past couple of years. That was the big uh, upset victory that he had, and also submitted Mihal Oleg Sashek, who was undersized and just kind of slipped slipped up in there too. But you know that that fight took place uh, back in 2019. We're talking about five years ago, so we're talking about a 35 year old OSP compared to a 40 year old OSP. So. Um, I'm 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 all over Kennedy uh, Zuchuku here. I think that he, I think he's very live to get a knockout. I think he'll be the aggressor. I think OSP will be on his back foot, you know, doing his little dilly dal, looking to to hit a little counter strike. But Kennedy should be more measured. He'll have a, a three inch reach advantage. He has huge limbs, and I think he'll throw some nasty shots down the pipe. And OSP will eventually not want uh, anything to do with it. And I think this will be the retirement fight for OSP. I think he gets finished and we don't see him fight again in the UFC. Uh, so for all you OSP fans, appreciate watching him in there one more time. He's had some big performances, man. We got to mention that John Jones fight that he had where he almost won that fight. It was a very close fight. 
And that was the John Jones that was coming off a long layoff, one of his many long layoffs. And uh, he's had some moments, man. He's, he's had some moments throughout the year. So uh, big respect to him. And uh, how about the OSP choke, right? Uh, the Von Flew choke, right? I believe it is, but kind of changed to the OSP choke. He started catching people with that all the time. Um, hopefully I didn't just make that up. But uh, you guys know what I'm talking about here, right? Let's pull it up real quick. Uh, he pulled off this submission uh, a lot of times in the cage. And um, yep, the Von Flew choke pulled it off on Nikita Krylov. Uh, might have pulled it off on uh, right. I don't know. You guys catch the gist, man. I'm sorry, guys. Did I mention I'm under the weather over here? You guys, I've been hurting. You guys know what I'm talking about, though. It was the Von Flew choke, and he caught quite a few guys. And I'm trying to pull up some of the people that he caught it on. He, he pulled off a variety of tricky subs, too. Straight arm lock on T Tyson Pedro. Uh, caught Mick Mihail with the Von Flew choke, the OSP choke. Um, you know, so that that's what he does. But I don't see him pulling off a sub here, and I'm not banking on him hitting him with the counter. Uh, Kennedy is a massive minus 600 favorite. Open up as a minus 425. He's a huge favorite. And there's a reason why he is a huge favorite. I expect him to get a first round or second round uh, knockout finish here. I'm pumped to see my boy Brian Battle getting a co-main event slot here. He's taking on Ange Lusa, the very talented Lusa. This is a big fight in the division. The winner of this is going to take some serious uh, momentum from it. You got to believe that the winner of this fight will really start to be uh, barking up the, the division here. Uh, Brian Battle, since winning the Ultimate Fighter, he's been going out there getting W after W. He took one loss uh, via decision against the extremely uh, refined Renat Fakradinov, right? That's a fight where uh, you have to understand there's a little bit of a learning curve. Battle got into the game later than a Fakradinov. Fakradinov uses grappling and wrestling. Uh, expect Battle to continuously look sharper every time he's in there to refine his overall game. You know, that was a fight that he was just a little bit of a step behind in regards to his grappling, but you see him developing, man. Uh, and you just look at some of the work he's been putting in, uh, submitted Andre Petrosky uh, there on the ultimate fighter. Well, he was on the show also uh, had a decision over uh, Cameron uh, Lachinov and then, uh, you know, st straight to business there submitting Gilbert Urbina getting a decision victory over Treshawn Gore, knocking out Takashi Sato. That was a coming out party for him. The way he hit him with that head kick, that was stellar. Whether or not Sato's been a little bit on the decline, hitting him with that head kick was big time. We talked about the Renat loss, then knocks out Gabriel Green and just submitted AJ Fletcher. So we're seeing that he's just very well-rounded and that he's really starting to peak as a fighter. Uh, Ange Lusa has been looking very good as well. You guys know we cashed in on a major play on him against Heist McKee. I caught it at a great line as well. I think it was like minus 165 or whatnot. I was uh, baffled by the line. Um, and I'm very familiar with that fight, even as I went back to the tape, because uh, I was glued to the TV. I, I have the... the uh, reaction video of me watching that fight uh on my pinned on my instagram page you guys can check that out at mma fortune teller underscore that was a big one for me and andre Lusa looked stellar throughout that fight but he had moments where he was putting himself in, in danger a little bit sticking his head in there almost got caught in a sub i just think that brian battle is going to be a step ahead here i do uh andre Lusa is dangerous with his striking but i think battle can hold his own there has a little bit of a range range advantage uh have a little bit of a reach advantage has an, an advantage in his legs leg reach as well he's a taller fighter and uh as they just mix it up that's the thing right it's not it's not going to just be a kickboxing match because i do believe andre Lusa is very polished there as they mix it up though i think that brian battle uh he, he's a fighter that that can kind of go off the cuff a little bit more so than Angelusa. We see Angelusa, sometimes he gets so stuck on just being a technical fighter. He's coming in and then he has these mental lapses. He gets tagged a little bit here and there. And I think that battle will just improvise a little bit better. And, um, you know, we've seen Angelusa take some L's. He lost to Manor Lazes, the Jack Della Maddalena fight. I mean, that we look at that fight so different He's, right now. I mean, Jack Della is, forget about it. Um, but he has a loss to Jonathan Thompson, took that over in, in, uh, over in the LFA. But Ange Lusa is a guy that surrounded himself with some of the best for years, and he is a dangerous fighter. But I like I like Brian Battle uh, to get the job done here. Uh, Brian Battle has been a fighter that's been harder to touch throughout his career, only being landed on at 3.73 strikes per minute. Lusa being landed on at 6.88. He's there to be hit, so he'll have his, his offense coming at Battle, but Battle will have plenty of opportunities to land on him. Um, and Lusa, yes, he's been very active, landing 6.32, but Battle's been holding his own, landing 4.52, which is, um, that's not a bad number. So yeah, I like, I like, uh, Pooh Bear to show up, get the job done. Wouldn't be surprised if he pulls off a submission here. Uh, if, if Lusa slips up, I could see him getting subbed. 
Um, but even at, even if as they strike it out on the feet, I think Battle still edges him out. I like Brian Battle to get the job done here. Um, I'll say he gets a sub. I'll say that they go to war and, and they clash and somehow he ends up on top of him. Uh, maybe a rear naked choke uh, get, gets locked in there. Battle opened up as a minus 160. He's now minus 180. And um, I still like it. I like it. I like the line. Even at minus 180, 190, minus 200, I like Battle. I'm telling you guys, I feel he gets the job done here. Hey guys, real quick before we jump into the main event, if anyone's looking to sign up to a new sports book, Bavada.lv is a sports book I use. Just reach out to me if you're looking to join. You guys will get an added bonus to your account if you sign up through my referral link, and I will give you an entire month uh, for my my official plays. I'll give you a one month package. So if anyone's looking to sign up, don't hesitate to reach out to me there. Here we go, guys. We made it to the main event. Tai Tuivasa steps back into the octagon, uh, coming off a little bit of a layoff, not too long, but uh, taking on Marcin Tybura. Uh, this is a matchup of two top 10 heavyweight fighters. Uh, this is a big fight for both of their careers. They want to get the train back on the tracks. They really want to get it to to start chugging along and get some momentum here. So huge fight for both these guys. Uh, I'll let you guys know right now, I've been a little torn and I've actually switched my decision uh, very recently leading up to me recording this. All right, so you're going to get my uh, my pick here in a second, but note that I was on the other side before jumping uh, to the other side now. All right, so... um. I'll be clear here, though. Tai Tuivasa is going to have to have success landing some big strikes in this fight, whether it's getting that that knockout early on in the fight, like he's gotten the majority of his victories. I mean, you take a look, 15 wins, 12 of them via KO, and almost all of them first-round knockouts, okay? So uh, when you're talking about a five-round main event, if he doesn't have success landing those, those big strikes, even if he doesn't get Tybura out of there, as long as he really... Uh, damages him to the point where Tybura is not really the same fighter, then Tai Tuivasa can maybe have some success going into later rounds. But if he doesn't at least land some big damaging shots early on in this fight, I think he's going to be in trouble. Um, he's still only 30 years old and has been taking a good amount of L's as of recently. So I, I know Tai is, is motivated for this fight. All right. I, I've been watching some of his Instagram videos. He's definitely motivated. And, uh, you know, maybe we see a, a, a Tai Tuivasa who's taking himself a little bit more serious in there. Uh, but I still wouldn't bank on him coming in in great shape and it just you know looking great in the fourth and fifth round. Whereas when it comes to Ty, Ty Burra, Ty Burra is a fighter that can chug along in, in the later rounds. We've seen him get W's in fights that go uh, 15 minutes. Uh, you know that, that fights where where the pace is being pushed and he, he edges out those decision victories. He's a well-rounded fighter. But we've also seen Ty Burra knocked out. Uh, on, on numerous occasions, right? Uh, just got knocked out by Tom Aspinall. Although, Tom Aspinall is a different type of dude. For for anybody that ever wanted to see a fighter, right? If you ever thought like this, I'm like, oh, imagine if you took a welterweight and, and put him in a heavyweight's body and, and see how he would move fighting the heavyweight heavyweight uh, opposition. That's Tom Aspinall. That dude literally moves like a middleweight or a welterweight. It's crazy. So, uh, Ty's dangerous, but he ain't no Tom Aspinall. Um, so, he did get knocked out by Tom Aspinall. We saw him knocked out by Augusto Sakai, who has a little bit of Frankenstein syndrome. Uh, that is the debut, the, the the debut of Frankenstein syndrome. We'll refer to that throughout the years. It was knocked out against Shamil Abdu Rakimov, who also has Frankenstein syndrome. Isn't that self-explanatory? What that is? A very stiff, uh, robotic, powerful type of dude. Uh, and and uh, Derek Lewis doesn't have Frankenstein syndrome. I won't do him like that. But remember the comeback knockout victory Lewis had. All right. So there's just been so many knockout victories. Uh, even Stephen puts. Come on, a guy with the last name puts uh, got that knockout on him back in the day before he made his UFC debut. Ty Burrow has been prone to being knocked out. Ty Tuivasa will be very live to land a knockout in this fight. The issue is, is if Ty doesn't land that knockout, I think that Marcin Ty Burrow is going to take this fight over. Uh, he's 38 years old, is Ty Burrow, which is not that old for the heavyweight division. I think Ty Burrow is still hitting uh, on all cylinders here and could eventually get on top of Ty. Um, you know, he, he could start using his volume to kind of try to, you know, throwing that, that teak kick and pressing forward and maybe clinches up with Ty gets on top of him and breaks Ty. I'm going to say Ty Burra gets the W in this fight inside of the distance. All right. And I talked about all his L's, but can I mention some of his W's real quick? Uh, you know, going to a decision against Romanov and Blagoy Ivanov, Romanov, a little bit more of a flaky fighter, but more of a front runner. You know, he's a fighter that it has success early in fights, similarly to Ty. He weathered the storm there, got the job done. Uh, knocked out Walt Harris in the first round. Uh, finished Greg Hardy, Ben Ben Rothwell, Maxim Grishin, Sergey Spivak. 
uh, Stefan Struve, Andre Arlovsky back in the day when Arlovsky was more uh, more towards his prime than what he was, you know, from from 2017 on. You know, the dude refuses refused to stop fighting. But uh, I mean, he's had some respectable victories. Even uh, Damian Grabowski, Victor Pesta, if you guys remember them back in the day. But Ty Burra can can take over this fight. I'm gonna pick Marcin Ty Burra, like I said, to get the job done inside the distance. You have time to do it. And uh, initially, I was on Ty, but I changed. I changed my. Uh, my decision here, I think that Ty Burra is just more of a professional dude, and I'll trust him a little bit more so here. Let's go take a look at the betting odds where Ty Burra opened up at even odds. He's now plus 105. He's a slight underdog on Bavada. It doesn't surprise me. Ty Burra has the name, uh, excuse me, Tuivasa has the name. A lot of people love him, and people will gravitate towards him, put some money on him. The casuals will put some money on him, and he will be live to land a knockout. We'll analyze some prop bets in regards to this fight, there's a lot of props we could talk about for that fight. That's that's a fight we'll extensively discuss. We'll analyze the props in that, that prop video. All right, guys. So my pick will be Tybura to win inside the distance. We'll talk about some round props and all that stuff moving forward. That's my pick for the main event, though. All right, guys. That's going to wrap up this episode. Um, again, I apologize. This one wasn't my best. I'm losing my voice as we speak. I'm not feeling too good. Um, hopefully this, this gets better by the weekend. It's just Tuesday now. So I'm really hoping I can enjoy myself, especially for St. Patrick's day, which I got some time until Sunday, but, uh, um, I had something that I really wanted to talk with you guys. I'll save that for a better card. I had something good to talk about, but for my parting words for this one, I think we'll, we'll chain it right off what's going on with me being sick, man. You guys, you know how it is, man. When you're sick, you think about how you appreciate your health even more so. So make sure all you guys that are feeling good right now. Obviously, the majority of you guys are not sick, so make sure you guys are taking full advantage of your health. Go enjoy the week. Go grab a bite to eat. Go hop on your bike. Go for a ride. Go for a jog. Get out your house. Uh, enjoy the week. And once you get all your, your business done, go go get some fresh air. And obviously, as we go into the weekend, make sure you guys are enjoying yourself on the weekends as well and taking advantage of your health. All right? Say that much because, man, I can't really do Right now, I can't do a bunch of stuff that I want to do. I want to go to the gym. I want to go for a bike ride. Uh, I, want, I want to do different things like that. And honestly, I'm just about to go crash on the couch. All right. So make myself some soup. All right, guys. We'll leave you on that note. I appreciate all you guys so much, especially for you guys that hang around with me all the way to the end of these videos. You guys know you mean a lot to me. Enjoy the fights. Make it a profitable event for you guys out there. All right. Make it a profitable one. Signing out. Teller. Oh. Welcome to the show, this is the MMA fortune teller. Yeah. The MMA fortune teller. The teller. The teller. The teller.